To uh, present the theory in more detail, I would like to begin by describing how the theory explains the double slit experiment. If I could have slide two, please. This is the paradigm experiment of quantum mechanics. According to Feynman, it captures the entire problem of quantum mechanics. In this experiment, particles are emitted by a source on the left. They travel to a partition in which two slits have been cut. And some of the particles pass through the slits and travel to a screen. It's found that the particle intensity takes on a wave-like pattern on the screen as indicated by the wavy line. The wave-like pattern persists even if one fires particles through the slits one at a time, so there's no possibility of interference between particles. Quantum mechanics accounts for this as shown in the next slide. A wave is emitted by the source. Some of it penetrates the two slits. The two wavelets that come through the slits then interfere with one another at the screen. And the intensity, the amplitude squared, of the net wave at the screen then gives the probability that a particle is observed there. Now, as I indicated a moment ago, with forward waves, it's impossible to develop a local theory in which the wave carries the particle, with the particle remaining a particle and penetrating only one slit. David Bohm has developed an interpretation in which the particle is a particle going through only one slit, but his theory involves a non-local potential, a potential in which every point interacts with every other point. But if the potential at the location of the particle interacts with the potential everywhere else, that's equivalent to saying that the particle itself interacts with non-locally with the potential everywhere else. So this doesn't solve the problem. The conventional interpretations of quantum mechanics say that between the source and the screen, the particle is a wave, and that when the particle is observed at the screen, the wave collapses, and that somehow the particle goes through both slits. Now, the degree of wave interference at the screen in current theory can be computed with the uh, next slide. The path length between A and B depends on the slit penetrated. If the path difference, as shown there, the path difference is an integral number of wavelengths, one gets fully constructive interference at the screen and a maximum would be observed there. If the path difference is a half, half integral wavelength, one gets fully destructive interference and you see a minimum on the screen with partial interference in between. Now, the reverse wave explanation is shown on the next slide. Here, a wave is emitted from each point on the screen. The wave from a particular point penetrates backwards through the slits, producing two wavelets which interfere at the source. The intensity of the net wave at the source gives the probability that a particle is stimulated from the source in response to that particular wave. The particle then follows the wave to the screen, going through one or the other slit, but not both. The cross-section for the process, the probability that this process occurs, um, is already determined at the source by the wave intensity there, before the particle is emitted. So the probability is the same regardless of which slit the particle chooses, just so long as the particle gets to be by one path or another. Only the reverse wave has to go through both slits, thereby setting up the interference at the source. So instead of a particle going through two slits, one simply has a reverse wave going through two slits, which makes perfect sense physically. All particle motion in this theory is of a wave-following nature. So the only particles that arrive at B will be those following a wave from B. Now one can perform a similar analysis to this for, uh, I'm sorry, 
One can perform an analysis similar to that for the forward wave theory to determine the degree of interference of the reverse waves at A. Uh, it's, it's essentially the same as on the last slide. Um, there's a certain path difference, and it's the same path difference that you get in the forward direction. And if there's an integral number of wavelengths there, you'll get constructive interference, and half integral, you'll get destructive. So the, 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 the degree of interference is exactly the same in both directions. Also, any diminution of intensity between the slits and the screen, or between the source and the slits, is going to be the same in both directions. So the probability that you'll see a particle at B is the same as in the forward wave theory, aside from some proportionality factors depending on the, the intensity of the wave at B and the response at A. But those proportionality factors will be the same for any point on the screen. So if each small area of the screen emits these reverse waves with the same intensity, you're going to get exactly the right distribution, at least the, the, uh, the shape of the distribution, if not the overall magnitude of it. Now, as we'll see, the source also emits exactly the same number of particles as in quantum theory, and exactly the same number will go through the slits. So the absolute magnitude of that distribution on the screen will be correct also. Every particle has to go somewhere. And so if one has the same number of particles with the same distribution on the screen, you're going to get exactly the same number at every point. The pattern on the screen in this experiment looks exactly like that of a single coherent wave emitted from the source, which is one major reason why physicists have always concluded that the waves move in the forward direction. However, as I've just shown, one gets exactly the same pattern with a reverse wave emitted independently at every point on the screen. It's the very independence of the, 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 the waves from the different points that removes the non-locality. In the forward wave theory, one has one giant wave mutually coherent in all directions. And that wave has to then collapse non-locally or something equivalent to this when the particle is observed. The wave has to collapse because otherwise the wave for one particle might produce a second particle somewhere else and, and you'd end up with one particle becoming two particles. But with reverse waves, all the different paths are independent. The waves never collapse, they're present all the time, and they continue to stimulate more particles from the source as, uh, as long as the source is there. Now, notice one enormous benefit that we get from this theory right away. It involves no so-called measurement theory. When a particle arrives at the screen, it's simply observed. There's no wave function collapse, no transition from microscopic to macroscopic or what have you. Any unpredictability as to when a particle will arrive at a particular point is explained entirely in terms of what happens at the source. And at the source, one simply has a wave of constant intensity producing a constant probability of emission. So these statistical aspects are easily explained in terms of unknown parameters in the source. Nothing unusual occurs at the screen in this theory. So the whole subject of measurement theory simply evaporates. <laughs>